I'm sorry, I'm screwing up the camera for her. Uh, we're, we're doing things a little different today, obviously, you know, we're, we've never quite chopped the service, the service up quite so much, but it's for a very important reason. And um, the sermon today, I've entitled this, this talk, um, Love is the Answer. And I know it sounds like a 70s song, but um, I'm, not, I'm not talking about cheap grace here, which is, uh, I, I'm often accused of preaching. <laughs> In, in saying love, but um, I, I think you'll get it when we get into it, okay? So let's just turn our Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, and I want to begin in, in verse 1. Chapter 4 and verse 1. <laughs> Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby we know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come is in the flesh. Christ is come in the flesh is of God. There is a gospel out there that teaches that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, does not it? But it's not what we teach. Jesus Christ came and conquered sin, death, and the devil in this equipment, brothers and sisters. Amen. And he's saying the greater things that he has done, you will do. How is that made possible? Mm -hmm. It's only made possible through the Holy Spirit. Because if we're making movements in and of ourselves, we're making movements that are wrong. We, we may make a good step, but we're going to have to make five steps backwards. You know, um, if we're walking in the Holy Spirit then we have our marching orders as Christ did. Everywhere he went, everything he did was an ordained uh, appointment. So we can have that same victorious life. And Christ has given us his spirit, the Holy Spirit, so that we can have this. Uh, in, chapter, in verse 3 it says, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. This isn't any secret. We know what this is talking about. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. I would say amen. Amen a hundred times. Mm. Because God, God has... He's already won the victory for us. When, when are we going to allow him to have full place so that we can have this kind of victory that he's already bought and purchased for us? You know, it's found in this love. This love, you and I, brothers and sisters, that I'm trying to speak of here, we're not capable of producing. This, this love, if you read down through here and you look these verses up, this word love is a God. This is God love. This isn't man love. Verse 5. There are of the world, therefore, there are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world. And the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How do we know that? Through the Holy Spirit, right? We, we have, you know, we're, we're so engrossed in text today. We love our texts, right? You can text on your phone, and you don't really have to interact with somebody. You can just send them a text, and they, you know, they can get to it when they get to it. It's kind of really, um, it, it takes the personal part of it out, doesn't it? Um, but how often do we get into these 66 texts that God has given us? <laughs> this, this isn't just a, a regular text. This, this Bible is, is a living word. Amen. This gets inside of you. It changes you. Mm. We, have to, we have to look at this as though we, we don't know anything. As though we've never seen it before. We need to read it as God that wants to speak to us. If we come at it from that, that point of view, that we don't think we know anything of it, God is able to, and oh, 
But we are open to hear what God has to say. That's why it's often good just to take a brand new Bible that you don't have writing all over and start again. Because you see things in a whole new light. You know? God has many things that he wants to do with us and in us, but we don't allow him because we stifle him. We stifle him in, the, in the unbelief, not allowing the Holy Spirit to have full place in our lives. God is certainly waiting for this demonstration, this demonstration of his people to finish the work. The world is crying out for this demonstration. What, was it Muhammad Gandhi that said if God was raised by Jesus, all of India would be saved? All of India. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is what? Love. This isn't an attribute of God. This isn't something that he has that he carries in his pocket. God is love, the Bible says. That means everything that he does, he does because he is love. Amen. So even when he is judging, he is loving. Amen. Amen. We, 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 that, that's a big thing to take in and try to understand. I mean, can you imagine the awesome responsibility of knowing everything? Stop and think about that for a minute. Stop and think about the awesome responsibility of knowing everything. Can you imagine standing there talking to somebody that you would know in five years from now is going to kill somebody? How would you talk to that individual? How would you look at that? God has an awesome responsibility. Think about the responsibility that Jesus took by hanging up all that responsibility and walking in this flesh even though he was very God. Imagine the temptation that you can't even be tempted with. Verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that, that we might through him, what? Live. Live. Think about, think about Abraham getting this call from God to go and sacrifice his son Isaac. John talked about it in Sabbath school today. Think about that. This man that he was promised this son, and he's a hundred years old. He has this child, right? This is the son of the promise. This is the son that God said would would do would do what? Populate the earth. Populate the earth. He would be the blessing of the world, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And God is saying to him, "Go and sacrifice this boy." What kind of faith do you think that took? Do you suppose that he was listening to the Holy Spirit? I mean, that's pretty wild stuff when God's telling you to go kill your son. You've got to really be walking by faith. And, and, and a testament to Abraham's faith is how he raised Isaac. Think about this boy. He's a young, strapping young lad. And, and Abraham's an old man. He's 100 years old. He tells the boy, jump up on the altar there because I'm going to sacrifice you. The boy does it. He doesn't fight his father. What kind of faith does that young man have? And, and what happens? Abraham has the knife, the Bible says, right? And he's about to stick it in the boy's chest. And what does God say? Ha! Abraham. 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 Now I know you what? You what me? You fear me. Oh, some people have a problem with that word. You fear me. What does the Bible mean when it says that Abraham fears God? He respects and he obeys. What does the word obey mean? It means to listen intently, right? It, we, we think it means doing all this stuff. But the word obey means listening 
listening intently, right? Abraham had to be listening intently to do what he did because Amen. that's way out of the norm. Amen. I mean, God was certainly not making sense here to Abraham. And certainly Abraham didn't tell Sarah, did he? What do you think Sarah would have done? She just shut that game down, buddy. That wasn't going to happen. You know? Um, you see, what I'm trying to get at here is this love of God causes us to fear. And I'm talking about a fear that's different than the world knows fear. You see, the world... My wife is making a sanctuary, and this, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, she's this beautiful sanctuary. Wait till you guys see it. I know she's going to give me a hard time for building it up so, but I think it's beautiful. And she has a little altar of sacrifice, right? And it looks like a fire coming out of it and everything. I walk in one night, and this is sitting on the altar of sacrifice. And I'm telling you, that just hits you right there. You stop and think that Jesus is represented in this little lamb. Okay? You know, in the Jewish economy, the little lamb was brought into the home. And it was a pet, like we have dogs and cats. And the children would fall in love with this. The, the mom and dad would be in love with this. And they would have to bring this to the sanctuary and cut its throat and catch the blood. And this would be their sacrifice. This would represent Jesus Christ. And it would hurt the people. You see? Because they needed a demonstration to know how awful sin is. Mm -hmm. See, we, we, we don't know how awful sin is. Because if we did, we would, we, would be in, we would be baptizing the Holy Spirit and we would stop sinning. What we need to do is stop looking at ourselves, brothers and sisters, and we need to stop looking at each other and look at Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. But what I'm talking about here, what I'm trying to make everybody understand about this love is the fear. You see, there talks about two groups of people at the end of time. At the end of time, there's a, there's a group of people that says, hide us from the wrath of of the lamb. You see this little lamb? Can you imagine it having wrath? Have you ever been around a lamb? They're the most docile creatures. This is an odd saying to say that hide us. They want the rocks to fall upon them because they can't stand the wrath of the lamb. You see, there's a group of people that fear to be in God's presence. Mm. But there's another group of people sisters that are afraid to not be in Amen. His presence. Amen. Do you understand? That is the difference. This is the kind of fear we're talking about. Not fearing man. Fearing that we would not have that relationship with Jesus Christ. That we would not have that into me see with God. You see, we want Him with us. That's the kind of fear that a Christian should have. That's why we don't look at our brothers and sisters in judgment. We don't look at ourselves to think that we're better than anybody else. But we look to Jesus Christ, Amen. the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. And He is the one that wants to change us. He wants to do this work in us that we can't even fathom. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, a moment a moment at the knee of the Savior is worth a lifetime of pain and suffering. Amen. One little teeny moment in His presence. <laughs> you could live a hundred years of pain and you would say it's all worth it. I'm talking about an eternity with God. Would we miss that for what? For what? What does this planet have? You name anything that's worth missing that. There's nothing here. This is a dark, dark place. That's all there is here, is darkness. God is waiting for His people to show the light. A demonstration of what He can do in Christ. 
a people that's so shine, that are so connected, that they move as one man. You wonder how God's going to do this? We need to just look to Him. He can handle it. He's already promised. Why do we have to worry about how He's going to do it? Why don't we just believe Him and walk in the Holy Spirit? Move as one man. When the world sees this demonstration, there will not be an individual left that hasn't made a decision for or against Christ. Yep. Amen. And when that final decision is made, brothers and sisters, Jesus will not wait a second longer. You know, we are at the very toenails of the sixth seal. Read Revelation 6, okay? When you read Revelation 6 all the way down through the very end of it, we are, at, we are done. I mean, we are very at the very toenails of the sixth seal. When the seventh seal opens, right, in, in chapter 7 of Revelation, what does it say? And there was silence in heaven. Why is there silence in heaven? Because nobody's there. They've all left to come here. Can you imagine the entourage that will welcome us? Can you imagine? One angel, Gabriel, came to roll the stone. When, he, when his foot hit the ground, the earth quaked. The earth, we're talking one angel. Do you have any idea how many angels are coming? And the, the, the power that they have is nothing compared to God. God speaks and it is. <laughs> he knows the end from the beginning. What can God not do? The only thing God can't do is things that He wouldn't want to do anyway, and that's lie. God would never lie. <coughs> he would never lie because if He came out of His mouth, it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had one simple test. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it. Why? Because God knew that we didn't need this knowledge of good and evil. We only needed good. Amen. God bears that responsibility. But we asked for it. We got it now. But we cannot walk without God. We stumble in the darkness. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's it in a nutshell. Verse 13. No, verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And His love is perfected in us. Amen. This isn't ordinary love, brothers and sisters. This isn't love like we understand love. This is love that's beyond comprehension. Hereby we know... Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us because He hath given us of His Spirit. Do you think God would hold anything back from His children that He loves? Don't you think the Bible even says that He's more willing to give to us the Holy Spirit than we are to ask for it? Mm -hmm. That should make us ashamed. That should make us ashamed. Because we walk around like we have something when we have nothing. You know, freedom, brothers and sisters, comes in surrender. True life comes in death. Something, it's going to cost you something. You have to die, and I have to die to self. So that we can understand how Jesus, the pattern, the way, the truth, and the life lived. He said, the words I speak, they're not my words. The things that I do, I do of the Father. Did you see him any, anything? No. He was constantly pointing to the Father. To the Father. This is what we need to do. The same kind of way. We can live this same life. It, it's not rocket science. God's made it so simple that people miss it. It's really that simple. Very easy to say, but dying to self is difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult. And why is it? 
I think, and until somebody proves me wrong, pride. Pride is the issue, is the root of all our problems. Because if pride is extinguished, then I see all, all my brothers and sisters as better than myself. Hallelujah. And you know what? You guys, therefore, aren't a problem anymore. You know what? <laughs> and if I have no pride, I certainly don't think much of myself. So where is my focus? God. God. And if God is my focus, I now have marching orders. I know exactly where I'm supposed to be. Jesus, they said, well, Jesus says it's not yet my time. They're, they think he's going to die. You can't go. He says, it's not my time. Many times in the Bible, you see where they tried to, they tried to grab him. The Bible says what? He disappeared. He just, you know, he was gone. Why? Because it wasn't his time. He knew exactly where he was supposed to go and what he was supposed to do. He was led of the Holy Spirit into the desert to be tempted of the devil. He allowed himself to go because he had divine appointments. And he didn't see any of it of himself. Look, the devil came to him and said, here, look, turn these stones into bread. I know you're hungry. You haven't eaten anything in 40 days. How many of you have eaten nothing for like three days? Maybe a half an hour. Can you imagine 40 days? You think he was tempted? Let us go on. Verse 15. No, verse 14. And we have seen and, to, and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be what? The Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Amen? Amen. That's, that's a pretty bold statement right there. All we do is confess. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Amen? Amen. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he, as he is, so are we in the world. How do we have boldness in the day of judgment? Let, let me, I'll go back to that. Let's continue. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. So how is it that we have, in verse 17 here, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment? What do we think about that? How do we have, how do we have boldness in the day of judgment? Isn't today the day of judgment? See, it was, it was, talked about a little bit in Sabbath school class today. There's many other churches in the world that believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath. There's other, there's other churches that believe in the state of the dead. But what separates us from everybody else is the fact that we realize that the judgment is now. When Jesus Christ comes, it's finished. It's done. There is no more time. Let us turn to Romans 13. Romans 13 and verse 11. I have a little heading over mine there, and it says, The Nearness of the Second Covenant. Romans 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. 
Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's turn to Psalms real quick. Psalm. Let's go to 34. Psalm 34. Psalm 34 and verse 7. I'm wrapping it up here. Y'all there? The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that what? And what? Ah, that's important, isn't it? Let's turn to Psalm 119. 